Welcome to HortTube. My name is Jim Putnam. This is the April Garden Checklist video. We do one of these each month just to go over the things that we're currently doing in our garden here in Raleigh, North Carolina. We're in zone 7B, almost 8A, right in central North Carolina. Those of you in colder areas uh, probably behind us a bit, and those of you in warmer areas probably ahead of us a bit. Our average last frost date is somewhere between the second and third week of April. So you, some, some places I'll see it April 8th, others around April 15th. This is actually just our average last frost date. It's not your like, I think sometimes it's mistaken as this is my drop dead last frost date. We won't get a frost after this. We had two really, 20, we had two 25 degree nights in late April, not that many years ago, maybe a decade or so ago. It was pretty devastating in the nursery business because everything had leafed out. I mean, truly everything had leafed out at that point. So don't trust that average last frost date completely. We well, you want to, if you're, if you're planning on planting tender things at that time, you want to be looking at a 10 day forecast, looking further out and making sure that, you know, don't trust that day. Because literally the, you get equal numbers of frost after it as you do before it, okay? We have a full moon, I think around April 6th or April 7th. Uh, and um, generally speaking, uh, 30 years in the nursery business, um, sometime around there, one side or the other of that full moon, we'll get a night down in the 30s. Whether that drops low enough to give us a frost or even a freeze, you know, I don't, I don't know. So uh, we're very cautious during the month of April, but we have started lots of things already to go in the garden. And as soon as we can, April's the month that they'll go in the ground. Just don't know where in April that's going to uh, be. You'll notice when you're shopping for plants right now, lots of things will have tons of new growth on them. You know, here's a butterfly bush that I got uh, that's going actually going into a container. It's a little dwarf butterfly bush. Uh, this is a, a butterfly candy series. Uh, really excited about these actually, but it's ready to, it's blooming already because it actually came from the Gulf Coast. And so, you know, this is a plant, a great example of a plant that if you bought it, you'd want to be able to, in a, you don't want to plant it yet because you want to be in a position, uh, a position to take it in and out or put it in a garage, cover it, whatever you need to do to protect it from uh, any, any frost or freezes. Same thing with any shrub you're buying that has tons of new growth on it. That new growth is super tender and any kind of frost or even worse, freeze, especially, you know, we get um, 28 degrees. That's the kind of magic number that makes me kind of panic uh, typically. And we had one of those here about a week ago and it really did knock some things back that had come out. It, in order to go down to 28, it's several hours below freezing, you know, and it come, coming back up to 32 takes a while. And so uh, those extended freezes are particularly uh, damaging. All of your summer, uh, this is probably the best selection of the year for plants though. So I would, I would go shopping for them. But again, if you're buying tender things, you're not gonna put them in the ground, definitely not put them in the ground yet. If you're buying shrubs that are awake, in full flower, that kind of thing, you might want to delay putting them in the ground till closer to your frost, frost free date. A lot of times when I buy something in full flower, let's say you went out and bought an azalea right now, and it was an absolute full flower. If you take that plant home and stick it in the ground, you're probably gonna shorten a few days off the flowers on that. It's gonna be a stress related change to that plant and it's gonna shut the flowering down pretty quick. So if you're bringing something home in full flower like a shrub, you might wanna just enjoy it, you know, in the container uh, for a bit and then uh, put it in the ground. All your summer bulbs are available right now. So I would get those elephant ears. Um, we have uh, dahlias, uh, tons of things that are available right now that may be limited by the time it's time to actually put them in the ground. We put up a video on the channel, uh, jump starting a bunch of those things uh, recently. And uh, you know, they're all, in the process of, of coming up back here. Here's an astilbe, you know, that uh, a perennial astilbe that's up and growing. Our dahlias are up and up and growing over here. Leatris is up and growing over here. Um, uh, Oriental lilies or Asian lilies are up uh, over here. So uh, we've jump started them, but we've left them in a container so that we can protect them uh, going in, you know, for this next couple of weeks, which will likely, likely see at least a threat of frost. If the plants are grown locally, they're going to be acclimated to your area. You definitely go ahead and put them in the ground. But again, you will see things, you know, that are way ahead of where they are in your garden or in other people's gardens in your area, just because again, they came from further south uh, to that garden center. You're also going to see flat out 
uh, plants that definitely can't go in the ground yet. You know, your ten, you know, ten, tender vegetable plants, tender annuals, and things like that that you, I would definitely want to avoid. Some of your hanging baskets that are, have tender things in them, probably going to avoid those things. Uh, if you're gonna do, be doing container planting for the season, again, you wouldn't wanna put your tender stuff in there until after your average last frost date and you're looking out into the future, but you can go ahead and get your, you know, your bigger shrubs, that kind of thing. Go ahead and put your base thing in your container and then later get the tender pieces for that. Still a perfect time to plant, to, uh, uh, transplant plants at this point but with once we get to the spot point where we have new growth on them you want to probably cut them back a bit when you're transplanting them so that's the way i've always transplanted plants is if they're actively growing you know if i when i'm digging them out of the ground you know digging the root ball out of the ground i'm damaging those roots so when i transplant it it's not going to have the same amount of, of roots that it had before and therefore not going to be able to maintain the entire top of that plant well without it being stressful. So on something like this, if I was moving this big plant, this big Laura Petalum right here, I'd cut 20, 25% of it off, dig it out of the ground, transplant it, and I think you'll find that you can transplant your plants much more easy that way. Not as easy to do with conifers. If you're transplanting conifers, I may have wanted to do those further back in the season before they started to put on a lot of new growth. Not as easy to cut back. One other consideration right now is the soil can be very wet. I don't know where you are, um, you know, what conditions you have, but if you're planting in extremely wet soil, you know, be careful not to com really compact those beds back down and re-stomping on the soil and stomping soil around your roots and that kind of thing, because it will overly compact the soil. I like to let the soil dry out just a bit in between rains. It doesn't have to be dry, you don't want it dry, but I don't want it, you know, flooding conditions when I'm planting because I know that my foot traffic in the bed is not good for the bed and I know that my stomping soil back around the roots is going to be bad as well. A couple more things on plant shopping. One is to add native plants to your garden. So we put up a video up at Homewood Nursery up in North Raleigh maybe a week and a half ago or so if you want to go back and look at that video. It's just a few native shrubs in that video. They, um, You should see a great selection of native plants. Also pollinator plants just in general you know, plants that will attract pollinators to your garden. And we want to do that throughout the season. So the second, you know, another last point here on just plant shopping is it's really easy to go to a garden center in April and see all of these shrubs in bloom and be, and just grab them and grab them and grab them. And then what you, what you can end up with and what I've, I'll see a lot of places is gardens that just come to life in the middle of March and by May, most of the flowering things are just kind of done because a lot of this spring fever takes, you know, takes a hold of us and we go and just buy things that are in full bloom at that time. So do plan on going back, you know, later in the spring, late spring, summer. There's probably things in your area that you can find that will flower right through, uh, right through the season. So the next, next things up is our vegetable garden back here. And our vegetable garden, as you can see, has daffodils blooming in it. Uh, it has dahlias that are coming back from last year. We have herbs around the front of it. There's sorrel and sage and uh, mint in a container. Put your mint in a container or take over your, take over your garden. And there's oregano. Uh, there's strawberries planted here. Lots of a perennial herbs and things go along the edge. We have flowers here in the middle. We're actually doing a little bit of rearranging because uh, we want the vegetable garden to be part of the overall garden and not necessarily just, you know, vegetables here, you know, ornamental plants here. So we're trying, you know, we try to integrate that. We've got our cool season vegetables in the ground. So those were started from seed uh, almost two months ago now, a little more, and those are in the ground. So that's lettuce and broccoli and uh, uh, kohlrabi and several other things that we planted back here. Some things were direct seeded like beets uh, and uh, peas and a few other things like that. Still too early to put in our summer vegetables, but we've started most of them from seed. And so uh, as an example, uh, here's our tomatoes. Rained pretty hard on them last night. I've got them outside in the sun, but they will probably need to go back in the house a couple of times uh, between now and the in, in our, frost, our average last frost date. Peppers are here, they're up, they're ready. Again, I'm not putting them in the ground. The other thing is there's kind of no point in putting them in the ground uh, too early anyway. You need peppers like the soil temperature to be about 65 degrees. And so there is a website that you can go to and see what your soil temperature is. So it's not just your air temperature, but your soil temperature as well. They, they don't 
they like the you know they like the sun, the warmth from the sun and the warmth from the soil. So those things won't go in the ground. We've also started tons of flowers uh, directly from seed. I'm just trying to save money. These things will be available for purchase in a garden center, and hopefully you can find smaller containers because things like these salvias that we started from seed, they're going to get this big during the growing season, regardless of whether I spend twenty-five dollars on it or I can spend four dollars on it, you know, or five dollars on it, whatever. So. Again, seed's still available. Plenty of time to start your own seed. Uh, if you're not gonna do that, wait until after your average last frost date before you're purchasing those things. Definitely time to be doing potatoes. We do potatoes in grow bags. They can be also done uh, in the ground as well. One other thing on the uh, vegetable garden that you're also gonna be waiting for is uh, direct seeding. So if you're doing any direct seeding, you know, of and what a lot of our stuff gets direct seeded. So, uh, beans, squash, uh, cucumbers, all those things come up so readily from seed that we don't start them in the house. I find peppers and tomatoes really need to be started early or purchased. Um, you know, they, they like very controlled environment to germinate well. Doesn't mean you can't be done, but uh, I think you'll find that overall you'll get more consistency from your tomatoes and peppers by either starting them from seed yourself or purchasing them already started. Almost everything else can be direct seeded very, very easily in the garden. You can leave space to come back with a second crop uh, a couple months later so that you can make sure you're extending your season all the way. So if you've got extra space, you can leave a little bit of that and uh, start some additional tomatoes and peppers and other things later to give yourself a second round, especially on things like squash and zucchini. A lot of our vegetables just kind of burn out by midsummer here or mid to late summer. You can have a second crop uh, coming in. Our cool season vegetables will start being harvested about the same time that these other vegetables are going in. They'll, be, they'll, they'll grow pretty quickly with these moderately warm days, but not super hot days. They don't like that. Uh, we'll start harvesting those things and then we'll just interplant our tomatoes, peppers, everything else in the cool season vegetables back there. And hopefully they'll come up and shade those and extend that season just a bit for those cool season vegetables. Here in the South, Lettuce will burn out on us, you know, when we start to get consistent 90 degree days. One other thing you'll find when you're shopping right now, this may be the best selection of fruiting shrubs, like figs and blueberries, that kind of thing. Fruiting vines, like uh, blackberries, raspberries, that kind of thing. Fruiting trees, uh, lots of edible plants, edible perennials, asparagus and strawberries, and I could go on and on. This is the time of year you can find those things easily. Again, if they're way ahead, you know, of where you are, I just leave them in a position to protect them until after your frost free date. But I would, would acquire them because, again, this is probably the best selection of the year. Uh, you know, they gather all those things in uh, at one time and when they disappear, they kind of disappear. So um, if you haven't fertilized yet, I would go ahead and fertilize uh, your garden. I don't, we don't use a lot of fertilizer here. I've got videos on my channel pretty much each and every year of the channel showing the organic fertilizer I use in February or March here in Raleigh. It can still be done now, definitely not too late. I'm too early when I put that video up because I'm just trying to show off what I do. And what I do is put out very little fertilizer because most of the fertilizing that's going on here is from our mulch breaking down uh, over time. We added originally added compost to this garden. That can be done through adding wood chips and letting that break down and become humus. Uh, there's a lot of different ways you can create that, that organic layer on the top. Um, but again, just adding organic material to the garden is a lot, most of what you need, especially here. We, we have a clay based soil here and as annoying as clay can be to dig in, it is pretty nutrient dense typically. And so that combination of my organic material, which is inviting earthworms and beneficial fungi, beneficial bacteria to live in the soil that combination um, um, with a very small amount of organic fertilizer once a year is all these plants need. We do very little fertilizing here. Second thing is, again, mulching. If you're gonna be doing big projects, you're planting a big bed, you might wanna hold off mulching that bed until after you've done a lot of your foot traffic in it and then mulch it. Uh, I planned on mulching during March and I talked about that in the March garden checklist video and I haven't gotten to it yet. And in the meantime, we've had uh, quite a few weeds come up, mostly in the, mostly this, we have some maple tree that's next to us in the neighbor's lot and it is very seedy. So there's thousands of little maples out here we need to pull uh, before we mulch. And we, we use triple shredded hardwood mulch in the beds, uh, which is just ground hardwood bark. But again, you can use any kind of mulch, any kind of organic material 
uh, is fine uh, in your in your beds because it's going to hold moisture in place. Again, it's going to create a barrier for all those living organisms, the beneficial living organisms that actually are feeding your plants uh, and making nutrients available for your plants. Our annual spaces that includes the vegetable garden. These are annuals, right? These are tomatoes are technically perennials. To, uh, uh, peppers are technically perennial plants, but here where I live, then this winter is going to kill them, so we're treating them as annual plants. So annual beds for flowers, annual beds for my vegetables, they're getting a new round of compost uh, each season. So we do uh, annuals around our bed edges, around our turf in the front garden, around what it's going to be a patio in the back garden, along paths. Those things get compost because we're trying to get as much out of them as we can. If we, you know, if you, you're buying a plant and it's literally only going to live for six months, you want to get as much out of it as you possibly can. So we treat those areas a little bit differently with some new compost. Our beds where our ornamental plants are, flowering shrubs, perennials that go to sleep and come back, our bulbs, all those things, they're just getting fresh mulch. Uh, we do that two times a year with just a thin layer each time. Anything I'm talking about in this video, whether it's fertilizing, mulching, pruning, uh, how to start seeds. You know, this, this video is more of a, this is what we're doing this month. Uh, but I have individual videos for these things and we're constantly making content around what we have going on in this garden here in Raleigh. So uh, keep that in mind. If, if it's something you hear in this video, I probably have an extended uh, video for it. We're not going to have to do a whole lot of watering here in the garden in Raleigh, North Carolina in April. The soil's pretty moist. Uh, it's a little drier than I'd like it to be. We got a good rain last night which you may be able to see in this video, but we hadn't gotten a whole lot recently, but even still, not really gonna need to do uh, any, any, any watering. If you're in an area where you have seasonal rainfall and it's starting to dry out already, obviously you would. And when we plant something new in the ground, we're gonna water it in and then uh, hopefully not have to do a whole lot of watering on it, honestly, until summer. Uh, pruning is definitely something you can still be doing. So as an example, azaleas are something that we would not have pruned uh, in the, uh, in the winter time because it carried its flower buds through the winter. But this azalea, this Autumn Majesty Encore Azalea is about to come into full bloom. It's a beautiful double purple. After it finishes flowering, if I needed to prune it, I could. So any of your early spring flowering plants, if they need pruning, you can do it right after they finish flowering. Pretty much true of any flowering plant. Plants that you're not relying on the flowers, um, you know, maybe it's something like a holly, which does flower and it does maybe fruit, but you're not relying on it for that. You can still do the pruning on those things. You can still prune your conifers at this point. If you've got ground covered junipers or anything like that, you can be pruning them. Another thing that'll need to be pruned and thought about is suckering plants. And so, uh, you know, I've got plants coming back that we cut back very hard. You know, there's a few things in this garden that get cut all the way to the ground. And as they're coming back up in the spring, I'm gonna decide how many of these these pieces that I actually want. And so eliminating those suckers uh, as needed. And there's a lot of those kinds of flowering plants like that. I can see the lilac on the other side over here has 20 suckers down at the bottom of it that I probably will eliminate. And that just means cutting them back to the ground, you know, as they're emerging in the spring so that I only have five or six, you know, pieces for the plant to, for the roots to supply energy to. So if it's a flowering plant, like a, high, a perennial hibiscus or something like that, you're going to get a lot more big giant flowers off three or five stems rather than 50 stems. If you, the more stems you have, probably the more, it's just the more energy the plant has to maintain all those leaves uh, and, and stems. It's definitely time to divide some of your uh, perennials as they're emerging in the spring. So if you've got daylilies, hosta, things coming up and they look a bit crowded, you can pop them out of the ground and divide them. We're gonna have some videos on that upcoming. The other thing you'll get is perennials that are just absolute bullies in the garden. A lot of your perennials will just get slightly larger each year. This Rhythm and Blues salvia, uh, originally planted right there, is now up under this uh, hydrangea, uh, up under another hydrangea over here. I can see it, you know, it's now taking a space as wide as, you know, five by five or something here. Uh, and it will continue to do that. So as these are popping up, I simply take a shovel and, uh, and, and, and put up under it. I'll grab a shovel right here behind me and, uh, and show you. I'll just take any of these pieces and I can just chop them off, um, you know, just like that. Any place that I don't want them. If I want to, I can go under it like that and I can actually pop it out of the ground. And right there, I have a whole new uh, salvia 
that I can put in a container or plant directly in the ground. So you can either, you know, chop them, you know, aggressively to uh, eliminate the space that they're taking up quick and easy. Or again, you can just divide them and give them to a neighbor or something like that. But there are some bullies that will come back up in the garden. We've had a beautiful display of bulbs during the month of February, March, and we'll continue to have some of our later daffodils and stuff blooming right into uh, April. But at some point, they're gonna finish flowering. Uh, we would love to know, make sure that we know where they are in the garden. So a couple things with these bulbs as they start to fade. Uh, we definitely wanna know what they are and where they were uh, so that we don't come in here and plant something right on top of them. Or if we do, we're being super careful, you know, digging. Uh, Cause I, I don't mind having things come up in and around my bulbs, but again, I don't wanna damage them in the process. So uh, Mark, you know, write down somewhere the names of them. Also any mapping, that you're doing, any new things that you're adding to the garden, especially things that die to the ground in the winter, like perennial flowers and uh, those kinds of things, you know, having notes about, you know, where they are and, you know, what they are. And, you know, sometimes we'll find something that doesn't come back and we wouldn't have had any idea that we had tried it, had ever tried it and it had failed for us if we didn't have it written down somewhere. So we can go back and go, you know what's missing? Whatever it is, um, is missing. Other thing on there, your spring flowering bulbs is they actually need this foliage. It's not the most attractive thing in the world, uh, but they do need it. And they will use the sun's energy to, uh, re to reinvigorate that bulb and prepare it for next year's flowers. Ours are planted in and around other things. And so, you know, this shrub, this shrub, and the perennials that are in front of it will cover them up pretty quickly. Uh, so that's how we kind of integrate our bulbs into the, in, into the landscape that way really need to be prepared to continue to cover potentially. Uh, we've had some really warm weather mixed in with a little bit of a uh, couple frost here or there and everything is so far ahead. We just have tons of perennials, salvia, agastache in front of me, the uh, 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 upright phlox there, a cone flower there, you know, just lots of things that are coming up pretty quickly. Have several videos on winter protection in the garden if you wanna go back and watch one of those, but we'll just take an empty, upside down container and put it over these perennials on nights that are, that potentially have frost. You know, at some point, everything gets so far ahead that you kind of got to pick and choose on what you're going to protect or not protect. And so, you know, hard choices, you know, keep old sheets around, you know, fold them up somewhere. You'll find that old towels, old sheets, you know, not throwing those things out and disposing of them, but putting them in a shed somewhere and maybe in a plastic bag so that you can keep them you know, high and dry, keep the animals out of them. Cause you know, if you put, you put towels in a shed, that's a good spot for to, for, to find a rodent later. Uh, but you know, keep those things somewhere so that when you need to protect those things in the garden, um, you know, you have materials available to do it. We have tons of house plants in the house right now. And again, it's another thing you have to be careful with transitioning to outside uh, for a couple of reasons. One is Again, you could have frost on them and a lot of these things don't, don't particularly like frost. Some of the things like yuccas can be a little more cold hardy, but not knowing that, wait and you know, don't bring all your house plants out, you know, or, or if you do bring them out, be prepared to, to take them back in. Uh, if you need to, if you're taking your house plants completely outside, be really careful with the light intensity because the light intensity in your house was probably not much. They were probably in less sun than they wanted. And if you transition them out into a lot of direct sun, uh, they can definitely be burned, but it's a good month to be, you know, as you're transitioning them out, you know, repotting them, uh, up potting them. Uh, some things uh, probably need pruning. You can fertilize them at the same time uh, you do that, but that's what we're in the process of doing right now is making those decisions. So a few years ago, we actually did much more detailed, uh, longer videos uh, for the first year we did them with lots of additional things on a month to month basis. We've kind of narrowed it down to what we're concentrating on here uh, during that, uh, you know, during the month of April in this particular video. But if you go to the playlist on the channel for monthly checklist videos, the original April one will probably have even more information than this. And again, there's individual videos for all the things I've just talked about uh, in this video. Those of you in colder areas might want to watch the March video, might be more, you know, might, might be the video that's more in time with your zone five uh, area. I, I say in all of these videos every month, you know, visiting arboretums, visiting botanic gardens, visiting your neighbor's beautiful gardens uh, is a great way to learn 
what's flowering on a month to month basis or what's interesting. It doesn't have to be flowering. We rely on flowers a lot in our gardens because we love flowers, but you know, there are incredible gardens that are just shades of green. Uh, and, and, I, and I have an appreciation for uh, conifer gardens and you know, just, interest, just interesting gardens. Uh, we always want to talk about inviting bird, our bird friends into our garden. They're an important, important part of the ecosystem. And so we're you know, keep, uh, cleaning out bird feeders, um, cleaning out bird baths, uh, making sure that they're, you know, that they're comfortable in the space. Because again, they're an important part. Our, we have robins back here all day long, flipping leaves over in this garden before we mulch, you know, getting, you know, taking out some bad guys, I'm sure. They're probably taking out a few good guys as well, but they're taking out some bad guys along the way. A couple other quick notes, a uh, good time of year to be painting containers. So if you've got a lot of container projects going on, we know while you've got them empty, if you can clean them up, you can paint them and make your containers look basically brand new. Also a good month to do soil test. And one of the more important things in a soil test is your soil pH. If you haven't gotten your pH tested, I have a video on the channel for why soil pH is so important. You might wanna refer back to that video uh, and, and take a look at why that's important, but it can have some impact on what you're able to grow well in your garden. And it's an uh, inexpensive thing to get, uh, get checked out. Thank you guys for following along. Uh, what is it that you're doing in your April garden that I, that I failed to mention? Uh, we've got quite a few, again, we've got quite a few projects going on here. So please follow along with the channel to see those. Thanks for watching.